Okay. So I understand that we have all joined. I want to welcome everyone. And because we uh, have a lot to cover in a very short time, started right away. And as an introduction, unfortunately, uh, Sheila Boston, the president of the Bar Association, uh, ended up having a conflict, but she has uh, recorded a brief video. So we'll start off by, uh, by showing uh, the video. If you could please show that now. Good evening, beloved New York City bar community and friends. My name is Sheila Boston, and I am the president of the New York City Bar Association. I apologize for not being with you this evening live. I really wanted to, but somehow I did get managed to get uh, double booked. And please forgive me, Michael Cordoza, because I know we spoke about this months ago, but I also spoke with someone else months ago about another event. But please, please, please do know that I have the very highest regard for our special guest speaker this evening. John D. Eric. He is one of my illustrious predecessors. He served as the 56th president of the New York City Bar Association from 1992 to 1994. And ironically, that was at the exact time that I was actually graduating from law school and entering the profession. Now, back then, I heard some wonderful things about him. And I must say that ever since, I've been hearing some wonderful things about him. <laughs> Uh, he was one who was so active in the New York City Bar. My goodness, he was on the Judiciary Committee, uh, the Young Lawyers Committee, the State Legislature Committee. And I mean, I know that there are many others that I'm just not remembering at the moment, but we are talking about a very active gentleman even before he became president of the New York City Bar. He also, of course, uh, is well known for being Dean of Fordham Law School. So many people know him, so many people love him. Uh, I must tell you, I'm so excited that he's going to discuss his book this evening. I've read significant parts of it. I actually had a chance to do that. Um, and, you know, let me just actually take the moment, John Ferrick, to thank you because you sent me a copy. It was personally inscribed. So thank you so much for the kind and supportive words. I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, if there are consistent themes in John Ferrick's book, I would suggest that they include protection of the rule of law, access to justice for all, service to others, and a love and respect for humanity. Now, you know, all of these themes and missions, quite frankly, resonate with me resoundingly. And I am so pleased that the New York City Bar is basically honoring and hosting John Fierick in the manner that we are this evening for him to talk about his life story his life to public service. Because I think it's so important for us to revere, celebrate, and hear from those who are our heroes and sheroes while they are amongst us, living giants, if you will. Now, I talked to a friend of mine recently. Now, I'll tell you, it's a black female. And I just asked her, because I knew she had gone to Fordham Law School at the time that he was dean. And I said, well, you know, what do you think about this gentleman? Because we're going to be on, we're going to be speaking with him, okay, uh, on Monday night. And she said, and I quote, I loved him as Dean. He was the kind of guy who would be walking through the hallways. He'd stop you, he'd talk to you, he'd listen, he respected you, and you felt seen, heard, and respected. I thought that that spoke volumes. Because frankly, you know, you can read his bio, you can read his book, um, and hear about the things he's done. But you know, there's a saying that People may not remember what you say, and they may not remember what you do. One thing they'll always remember is how you made them feel. So congratulations to you, John Ferrick, on that note, because everyone with whom I have spoken said that you make them feel loved and respected. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Cordoza. I want to thank you, sir, for hosting and moderating this discussion today with our beloved John Ferrick. Um, Again, thank you for your service, John Ferrick. Thank you for your service to Michael Cordoza, another great public servant. But uh, John Ferrick, it's your night. So I just want to say thank you. God bless you. And may God keep you. And thank you for being with us tonight. So have a great time, everybody. Please listen and learn. Take care. And remember, 
Our theme this year is hashtag bar of hope. Thank you very, very much, Sheila. That was uh, not, I guess you're not hearing this, but uh, that was very nice. Um, let me note that because to ensure that we don't have vi uh, video problems, I'm uh, going to stop being seen, although I will uh, be talking uh, to ensure because I have a weak internet connection. And let me say at the beginning, what I plan to do is ask John uh, questions, trying to cover as much as I can of the book. I plan to leave uh, appropriate for questioning. So if you have questions, you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see where it says Q&A. And if you could click on Q&A and type your question. We're not, this is not a chat room, it's the Q&A. And if you type your question, then after I finish uh, asking questions, I plan to read as many questions like, as I can to John. So before I, we start, John, do you want to make any uh, preliminary uh, remarks? I just want to thank uh, Sheila uh, for beautiful statements she made uh, about the city bar and about myself. And uh, uh, she's already a great president. And I look forward uh, very excitedly to her, uh, her presidency. And Michael, uh, we go back, uh, two of us, a long way. And I really want to thank you for uh, your willingness to uh, uh, look at the book and uh, and uh, and talk about the book tonight. And it's an honor for me to uh, once again um, uh, face off with you as we've done uh, on a number of occasions. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, and at the end of this conversation, I will tell people how they can, uh, for those of you who have the book, I'll give you some information as to uh, as how you can purchase it uh, if you want it at a discount. Um, but let's jump right into this. Uh, and let me begin, uh, John. The first part of your uh, book discusses your family background, growing up in the Bronx in the shadow of Yankee Stadium. Looking back on your career, could you tell us what the impact on you and your career was by the fact that you were the son of Irish immigrants? Uh, I lived at... Uh, uh, on 161st Street, uh, the Melrose train stop, uh, not far away was Yankee Stadium. And uh, I, I lived there until I was roughly 26 years of age. And those 26 years uh, uh, living uh, uh, with my parents and my siblings uh, made possible uh, uh, so much of what came in my life. Uh, those were the dominant years of my life, I would say. Uh, uh, I, I, my, my, my mother and father uh, were, were role models for me. My father went away during the war years. My mother was both a mother and a father. And she became a, a mentor and a counselor of mine and uh, kept pressing me to uh, make something of myself and get an education. And, uh, and, and I took so many values from my parents that uh, uh, I internalized that when I became independent and, and, and made it part of who I am. Now, I would recommend the, the book gives give some fascinating insights to, to John's uh, upbringing and background. Um, but uh, given all we have to cover, I think it's best if we uh, start out uh, with discussing, John, your career after you left Fordham uh, Law School. Um, so, I understand that you started practicing uh, in 1961 at Skadden. What was Skadden like when you joined us? What did you specialize in when you were there? And how did the firm change over 21 years by the time you left as dean? I, uh, I was a summer associate at Skadden in 1960. Uh, there were two of us, a uh, uh, wonderful fellow from Cornell and myself. He died as a young lawyer. And uh, I think that might have been the start of Skadden's uh, summer program. And when I graduated, as you mentioned, in 61, I uh, firm was about 10, 11 lawyers. And, uh, and, and it was several partners and there were several associates and you did everything, you, real estate closings. So you went to uh, the municipal court, the city court, which were different uh, uh, courts at that time in terms of uh, jurisdiction, Supreme Court, 
Uh, I worked on proxy statements. Uh, uh, so uh, you really didn't have an opportunity to uh, become uh, uh, specialized in anything. I, I also worked on labor matters. Uh, uh, re representing uh, a, a printing union in a litigation against the New York Times, and I represented uh, uh, also uh, employers, Aeronavis de Mexico, Pakistan Airlines, New York Airways, working with partners who were the key uh, lawyers for those clients, and they drew me into learning about labor relations and uh, employment law, so to speak. So I, I really had a lot of experiences. And then what happened? Uh, where was Scott? lawyers 20 years later when you left? <laughs> well, it, had, it was almost at 300 uh, lawyers and uh, the firm had a going away party for me, uh, the partners, and uh, uh, which was hard. I didn't want a party because I knew I would cry, which I did. And, uh, and my, my swan song was that night uh, that uh, when I joined the firm, it had uh, uh, maybe 11 lawyers, 10 lawyers. Uh, as I was leaving the firm, it's labor, it's labor and employment uh, uh, department, which I was the practice leader of, uh, had 12 lawyers. So, uh, uh, although a scan at that point was close to 300 lawyers. So even though I, I had, it was a small area of the firm's practice, uh, I felt that uh, I, 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 I was part of making something happen when I was there. And it was a wonderful uh, 21 years at Scadden. Well, since you discussed this in the book, I'm comfortable asking you this question. When you were right before you left Skadden, could you tell us how your uh, partner compensation was compared to the salary you were about to receive as dean of Fordham? Well, I, I, the firm had reached a, a, a point. You know, I was there uh, 21 years. I was a partner for about 13 of those years, and uh, somebody showed me a sheet that said that uh, my, my compensation was at seven figures. Uh, a little bit more than a million dollars. I, I can't recall. Uh, some was capital, uh, and uh, and uh, that sort of uh, you know got my attention. But uh, 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 when I did leave, uh, uh, and at that time, uh, I I took on a, a different kind of uh, service uh, uh, for sixty-two thousand dollars a year. So you can see sixty-two thousand. So it was a pay cut. Wow. Uh, I think you talk in your book about your plans, how you plan to be as dean and whether you would go back to Skadden. Well, um, uh, I never expected to be dean. Uh, I, I had no, uh, uh, no plan for my life. I accepted opportunities that came along in service and, uh, and, uh, and the registrar at the school uh, called my attention to Skadden Ops when I was a second year student. So. Uh, it was always uh, somebody presenting a possibility, and uh, and uh, when I ended my uh, deanship in uh, uh, 2002, uh, that last year, uh, the firm asked me if I would consider coming back, uh, doing pro bono work, conflict resolution work. Uh, Chief Judge Kay asked me if I would consider being the first dean of the Judicial Center that they were building at Pace Law School uh, for the courts, and. Uh, and there were a few other people who had made suggestions to me that I should, uh, I should think about becoming a, a candidate, so to speak, for a, a federal judgeship. But uh, I, I, there was nothing that uh, uh, captured me uh, totally at that point. You know, I was 66 years of age and uh, didn't know how many more years I had. Uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, opportunities presented themselves. Would I chair this? Would I chair that? Would I be this? Homeless special master, uh, where where we engaged with each other, uh, and so it became a very rich uh, period of my life after my deanship, uh, and uh, and I stayed at the school, and school was very supportive of me staying around. Okay, well, we'll come back to uh, to Fordham in a minute, but let me go back to roughly when you uh, shortly after you joined SCAD, and I think one of the first uh, public service projects you took on. Uh, was one involving the questions that arise when a president is incapacitated and unable to function, which led to the 25th Amendment. Could you explain to those of us who, who may not have read the book your involvement in the 25th Amendment? 
Well, it was a, a multifaceted. I, 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 I had a great interest in the Constitution as a student at Fordham College and also Fordham Law School. I wrote a few notes for the Law Review at, and about the Constitution uh, when I was at the law school. So I wanted to continue writing on the Constitution, and I wrote an article on disability of a president because uh, Eisenhower had uh, several disabilities at the time that, uh, that I was going to school. And there seemed to be a problem uh, as to what is inability, who declares the inability, how do you deal with uh, a president who becomes disabled? And I wrote this article for the Fordham Law Review that was published in uh, October of 63 and uh, talked about having a young, able, healthy president. Uh, and I had, that, I had a letter from Time saying that four days before President Kennedy was assassinated. And I thought that was the time to solve the problem when we had a young president. And as it turned out, when the tragic death of President Kennedy, uh, the American Bar Association decided to uh, convene a, uh, a group of 12 lawyers, basically, uh, to take a look at the ABA position at the time and make recommendations for reform. And one of the staff people of the ABA, Lowell Beck, uh, saw this uh, article, which was uh, cited in the, the weekend that President Kennedy was assassinated, that weekend in a New York Times article by uh, Arthur Crock. And before I knew it, I was uh, part of a, uh, a meeting with uh, sitting next to uh, Senator Bai, who was, became the uh, chief uh, sponsor of the 25th Amendment, and Paul Freund, probably the uh, nation's leading expert. And we sat around the table for two, two days, came up with recommendations, and most of those recommendations are in the Constitution of the United States today. And you continue to play a role that went, went through the inevitable congressional process? Do you want me to say anything more about that, Michael? Well, yeah, I mean, you it was your first incursion into public service. So what else did you do on the 25th Amendment? Oh, dear. Can you hear me now? Oh, gosh. Can, can you hear me? I apologize. Michael? Yes. Got oh, yeah. I pick up on the bar, talk about bar associations generally, sorry. Uh, I can hear you, Michael. Oh, John. Okay, John, can you just explain a little bit more of after you had this meeting on the, the ABA? Uh, my, my phone so I could call a Clem. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, she here. Can, can you hear me? Uh, John, check your connection. Uh, I can hear uh, Michael. So Michael, can you hear me, John? God. Good to go. You may come. No, no, sir, I can't see. I can't see. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. Although it is as we wait to come back to look at the picture that we can all see of John Kennedy uh, there. But uh, uh, Kevin, you can hear me all right? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Um, I think it might be some speaker issue on John's side. Yes, I could try to ask him questions. Can you, John? Can oh, you hear it's me? A disaster! It just, it just, it just went frozen. I can't see him. He must have gotten lost somewhere. Can you help? Uh, John, can you hear us? John, you can't. You can't hear me. Michael. Yes. Hear me. Hello? Uh, John, we can hear you. Uh, oh, you can hear me, yeah. I couldn't hear anybody for the last five or six minutes or so. Uh, can you hear us now? What's that? Can you hear us now? Oh, yes, very clearly. Okay, so uh, you can continue. Okay. John, just a little bit more on the presidential success issue. Did you continue working on that as it worked its way through the Congressional 
process? Yeah, I got very active. Uh, uh, since I had written this uh, uh, study of the problem, uh, I, 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 began, I, 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 I began to work with Senator Birch Bayh, who was the principal uh, uh, proponent of the subject, also with the, the House Judiciary Committee. And uh, I was asked by the ABA to uh, chair the Young Lawyers Committee it created uh, to deal with presidential disability. And uh, so I was very active in uh, uh, chairing the Young Lawyers Committee and every, uh, had members in every state in the country. And then I was uh, uh, consulted by staff on the committees of Congress, uh, having done uh, the study I did uh, about uh, um, uh, language that might be in the amendment. And uh, I spent an enormous amount of uh, extracurricular time uh, I had my job at Skadden Arps that I had to hold on to, uh, you know, uh, but uh, the firm was very supportive of me and, and I testified before Congress on the subject. And uh, before I knew it, it was uh, uh, going through Congress and, uh, and then the state legislatures. And I remain active in, uh, in uh, supporting the ratification of the amendment. In some states, they were confused about the amendment in the, in the, in the legislative bodies of the states. And, and um, they sent my articles on the subject. I had done another one at that point. Uh, so, uh, so I was an academic, but I was an activist in, in advancing the amendment and also a consultant, you might say, to uh, uh, leaders in Congress. And this is all while you were an associate at SCAD, right? All right. And, 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 uh, and the amendment was proposed by Congress in 1965. And, uh, and then it, it went in the Constitution in 1967, and I, I just couldn't believe it. Wow. So that got you started, I guess, in seeing what the benefit bar associations uh, can be. That it, it was the first uh, public service program by the Washington Office of the American Bar Association. That's what I was told. And, uh, and what a success it was, because they played such a, a major role and uh, securing its uh, passage by Congress or proposed by Congress and also ratification. And I worked very closely with the leaders of the Washington office. They were constantly, for example, would you call uh, Representative Matthias from uh, Maryland and talk to him about this provision? Uh, would, you, would you get in touch with uh, Senator Ruska from Nebraska, maybe meet with him, talk about uh, uh, the amendment? So uh, I was given opportunities to meet with members of Congress and uh, and, um, and I guess you, you might say I had the credibility that went with uh, having done uh, a, a study of the subject, over, over covered it, the subject from the time of the Constitutional Convention right down to that moment. Wow. Well, I'm sure we could ask lots of questions on that, but uh, I believe you had roles with other bar associations as well. And uh, I yeah, uh, I joined the City Bar in, in March, of, uh, uh, on March 12, I learned today, uh, 1963, and uh, and uh, I was finishing up my article at that point that would come out in October of 63, and the city bar had a position uh, uh, which the ABA had and the state bar had that was quite different from what was in the 25th Amendment, uh, uh, that what became the 25th Amendment, and they basically would give uh, Congress the power to set up a, a method and, uh, and deal with it uh, uh, by, by statute. Uh, they would clarify certain issues in the Constitution, but the, uh, the 25th Amendment, as you know, it has a lot of detailed provisions how to handle a disability of a president. And, uh, and, and the question why, and the ABA changed that, its position based on the recommendations of this uh, consensus group that I, I was a member of. And I was given the mission to uh, try to bring the city bar around, so to speak. Uh, and I, you know, I was just a, a new member of the city bar but uh, uh, my article was circulated to the committee, the Federal Legislation Committee. And uh, before I knew it, I was working with their subcommittee uh, on uh, essentially uh, uh, helping the city bar uh, adopt the ABA position uh, that had the detail. Uh, State bar was not happy with that. State bar held on to its position, but both the ABA and the city bar uh, changed their positions. And those, and, and the city bar's action was very, very important. Uh, in the process of, uh, of having the 25th Amendment. I guess you said, all right, I've done my bar association work at that point in time. It was really just the beginning. And say in your book, uh, the service in the organized bar starting 
with the city committee uh, was a highlight of my life as a lawyer. I think I'm quoting it correctly. Yeah, it, it was uh, uh, an extraordinary. Uh, when I got to the law firm, I was in the army for six months. Uh, uh, in in '62, I was admitted to the bar in, in, in December '61, and I really got going. You might say at the end of uh, I got married in August of '62. And at that point, uh, um, I was really into uh, uh, the practice of, 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 of law. And, uh, and uh, first thing I was told in that period by one of the partners of Scadden, join a bar association. I didn't know anything about bar associations really other than they had a library. And, uh, and he said, it's not enough to join a bar association, join the city bar, get on a committee and get active. And told me of lawyers at, the, at Scadden who had been on committees, and um, I, I didn't know any better. I, I just uh, did that. And without realizing that uh, I would go from one committee to the other, not in terms of promotion or anything, but in terms of interest, the Young Lawyers Committee, the uh, Federal Legislation Committee, the State Legislation Committee, was a super involvement of meeting other lawyers my age, a little bit older. Uh, and uh, we worked together to uh, uh, produce reports uh, Federal Legislation Committee gave me a, an opportunity to testify before Congress on the Civil Rights Act. Uh, I worked with Judge S uh, the late Judge Sand on uh, uh, the voting age. Uh, that, that was in the period before the, uh, the amendment that uh, gave the franchise to 18 year olds. So it was an incredible opportunity to uh, be a part of your profession. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and then I was years later, as you noted, and as Sheila mentioned, uh, I was asked to become, uh, I was still dean of the law school, I'm still very active as dean. Would I consider doing the two basically, uh, being the president of the city bar and being dean of the law school? And I was encouraged by the president of Fordham University, the late Father O'Hare, that, that if, I could, if I was up to it, uh, uh, that would be wonderful to, uh, from the university standpoint to see the dean of its law school uh, rendering a public service like uh, serving as president of the bar and made available to me an assistant, uh, Beth Kogasian, who uh, created the, uh, helped create the music program at the city bar. And uh, she was my full-time assistant. So I, 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 as, that was an integral part of uh, my life. Uh, 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 you know, I was approached to put my name in for the presidency of the state bar after the city bar, but I really uh, felt that I couldn't do that. Uh, I was still dean of the law school, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's really where my commitment was at that point. I put a lot of, a lot of, a lot of time in when I was president of the city bar, as you, like, like you did as well. But we, there's someone who may have his... Uh, uh, what advice we give to young lawyers today about bar association activities, getting involved? Well, I, I know there's a lot of, uh, what advice I would give is very simple. Do what I did. Uh, <laughs> not, not that what I did was, it was not unique. I was doing what the lawyers did at that time. Uh, you uh, joined uh, bar associations, you got, uh, you got busy in their uh, uh, committee work and uh, you, you, you met other lawyers and you had opportunities of all kinds to uh, change the world in uh, certain ways. And, uh, and the city bar certainly has done so. And, uh, uh, and I think there's terrific opportunities uh, a, a, as you grow. I, I never saw the Bar Association as, as a place to go to enhance my law practice as such. You know, I, I, I left the law practice behind me when I joined those committees and uh, try to contribute as the other committees uh, did uh, to, to the work of the committees. Well, we spend the night on this, but let's, uh, let's move on to public service efforts. One of the things uh, uh, in your book is conflict resolution. Um, and one of the, you know, uh, the most fulfilling experiences of your life involvement in the New York City home disputes. Could you tell us what you did and why it was so uh, rewarding? Yeah, I, I, I was asked, uh, uh, I had just uh, ended my service as dean, uh, uh, which was a 20-year run, as I mentioned. And 
and I was working through what I would do for the next whatever years uh, God had plans for me. And, uh, and I was asked by the Legal Aid Society if I would be willing to serve as special, uh, I would willing to serve as a mediator having to do with controversies between the city and the, uh, and, uh, the Legal Aid Society about a, a family homelessness. And they tell, uh, the, the head of, uh, uh, of that program, the Legal Aid Society, said, we thought you knew Michael Cardoza. It was then the, uh, uh, co uh, co I think, the Corporation Council. And we think that he would accept you as a mediator because, uh, uh, because you, you knew each other. And apparently there were issues between the city and the Legal Aid Society at that point. And, uh, and it wasn't so clear that the city was interested in continuing with a, a, a mediator. However, I became that mediator, and, and thanks to you, Michael, and uh, and thanks to uh, um, uh, the Legal Aid Society, and and it had a profound impact on me. Uh, uh, meeting people who were homeless, spending a lot of nights in homeless shelters, and uh, and uh, and then coming up uh, with two other people who uh, you and the Legal Aid Society social workers made possible, so that I could. Uh, get up to speed on uh, dealing with issues of homelessness and, uh, and Gail Nair with uh, and, uh, and a policy background and Danny uh, uh, Cronenfeld who ran the Henry Street Settlement, uh, wonderful colleagues of, uh, we became. And it was a very exciting period. And at, that, at the end of that, I, I said to myself, I want to stay involved in this for the rest of my life. And did you? I did in the sense that what was involved was uh, dealing with the homeless, dealing with uh, uh, poverty, uh, and uh, dealing with uh, 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 all kinds of issues. Be and the reason I did is because the dean of the law school, uh, Dean Trainer, came to me as that service ended. And he said to me, you seem to have a passion for what you were doing with the others in terms of homelessness. And I would like to create a center for social justice at Fordham Law School, the dean said put your name on it. I wasn't happy about that. I figured I should be more in the background, but he, I put your name on it and then uh, figure out a program. So students would get engaged in social justice lawyering and also provide opportunities to volunteer lawyers, graduates of the school and other lawyers. And, uh, and that, 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 that center now will have its 15th anniversary in another year or so. So I've been heavily involved in the work of the center for social justice at Fordham law school and, very proud of the work that uh, Dora Gallicottis, who's our uh, executive director and our staff have done. And uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're a real group. Uh, we've made differences. We've, we've helped a lot of poor people and uh, we've helped immigrants, uh, immigrant children, uh, political asylum cases. Uh, we're, uh, we, we helped, we came up with the idea that we gave the chief judge of creating an attorney emeritus program. There's over a thousand lawyers registered uh, and providing uh, at, different, uh, at different times services and legal service offices and, and court programs dealing with those who are impoverished. So it really did make a difference in my life. Yeah. Another conflict issue that you got involved in that seemed to me fascinating from your book was your work in Northern Ireland and particularly your visits uh, with, that started with President Clinton. Uh, could you... Describe that a little bit for us. Yes, um, uh, I had a chance to uh, host the president. I didn't know the president and I wasn't involved politically. He needed an office at near Lincoln Center uh, to meet with his benefactors. So he needed a White House office near Lincoln Center and the office of the dean of the law school, I was that at the time became that office. So uh, uh, I met the president at that time, but two years later, uh, I, I think that was 93, maybe a year later, uh, I hosted a function for John Hume, who would, well, who would win the Nobel Peace Prize. And he appreciated the uh, function I hosted at Fordham for him. And then he turned to me and said, come to, Fort, uh, come to uh, uh, Northern Ireland and uh, make a difference. And, uh, and then uh, uh, we put in a proposal, encouraged by him, uh, to uh, uh, bring over uh, Protestants and Catholics, uh, sort of labels that are given uh, the different factions in the North uh, uh, to help them work through communications with each other and ha how, how, to, how to resolve conflicts and uh, sectarian kind of uh, conflicts. In the meantime, the president uh, invites me and 30, 37 or 38 other people 
to join him, uh, lay people, we weren't in government or anything, to go to Northern Ireland. And uh, first time an American president went there. And I think probably the reason I was invited to, to be a part of the group was because I hosted the president a year, a year or so before. And, 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 and I went uh, uh, at a time before the peace process, well, the peace process was, was in, in, in progress, but there was no agreement. And, uh, and got very much involved in a, not the macro level, George Mitchell was doing that, but uh, there was a need to educate about conflict resolution. And, uh, and I got very, very much involved uh, because of the program we had at the law school, bringing people over. And I still involved. Uh, the the uh, uh, school had uh, created a summer law program in Belfast and Dublin uh, back in 2001. And uh, we're, we're really into uh, activities in Ireland and people are, are seeing us as, as an independent, uh, constructive uh, uh, tool, you might say, in both the North and the South. That's great. Let me remind everyone that if you have any questions, because we're going to be asking questions in a few minutes, please be sure to uh, type them on the uh, Q&A uh, tab uh, so that I can... Uh, read them to John. Um, John, looking back uh, over your public service efforts, and obviously we could go on and on, uh, are there any others that are really particularly significant that you want to give a brief mention to? Well, I, I was heavily involved at the, uh, at the ABA level in the uh, abolition of the Electoral College, and that was in the late 1960s when both political parties thought it was a, a system that had to be changed because of uh, monkey business that was going on by George Wallace with reference to the 1968 election. I, I call it that. Uh, and uh, and I, I served as the advisor to the ABA Electoral College Commission. Uh, I stayed heavily involved in that for uh, a dozen years, and Senator Dirksen, minority leader in the Senate, wanted a proposal a constitutional amendment. Myself and one other person, with help from Paul Coyne of uh, Harvard, we drafted such a proposed amendment, and a, a lot of that amendment actually uh, passed the House of Representatives in 1969. So I got involved at that level, uh, but uh, I stayed invo very much involved in the city bar, uh, one activity that I'm very proud of, uh, I served on a committee of seven that created a lawyers in transition program, which didn't exist in the profession as far as I could tell at the time, so that the bar uh, would help lawyers who had a transition. Maybe, they, and, and before we knew it, we were helping lawyers out of law school, senior lawyers, and that's now a permanent fixture in the city bar, and I'm very proud to have been uh, part of that effort. Uh, I consider that one of the most important of of efforts of my life. Uh, since you graduated more than, I guess, 60 years ago, what were your estimates as to how much of your time you spent helping others in these kinds of activities? Well, the uh, way I look at it, if you count my writing, and I've done a lot of writing, law review articles, and uh, on, on real subjects, uh, that, that it, as, it, as it turned out, I would say half my life. Uh, and uh, you know, I didn't keep any clock on it, but uh, whenever that I had a vacation or an extra time at a weekend or a holiday, uh, my, my dear wife who's sitting in the room uh, uh, where, where I am uh, would tell you that uh, uh, she never saw me without a project. And, and in your view, how important is it for us to become active in public service one way or another? I, I, I uh, think it uh, makes the world a difference. Uh, it, you know, you, it's hard. I understand that. It doesn't have to be at the uh, macro level. I never anticipated uh, being involved in subjects like the Electoral College and uh, succession. I, 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 volunteering for the Legal Aid Society, for example, to handle a case, uh, uh, go to court to, uh, and maybe mediate a case in court programs. Uh, uh, a life without uh, uh, up, uh, doing things like that in the law today, I think is, is less, uh, uh, and I can't speak for others, but it's less satisfactory and has less purpose if you don't combine with the important work that you do, opportunities to serve, and they're everywhere in the profession. Um, haven't uh, done this since so a few questions, your internship at uh, Fordham. Uh, 
was it the school like when you arrived and how has it changed? How did the school? Well, uh, when I went to Fordham Law School, we were um, a small law school. Uh, uh, we, did, we had very little diversity, very few women, uh, uh, almost no color diversity. Uh, or, um, or, and, um, and by the time I, I, I became dean and, and finished the deanship, come up to the present time, I, uh, uh, you almost uh, could say you, you feel like you're in the United Nations. There's so much diversity, uh, so many women, uh, uh, law, law, uh, students from all kinds of backgrounds, so a dramatic change in terms of the face of the profession uh, as it existed at that time, as it existed now. And a big law firm back then was 60 lawyers. And today we have law firms, three or 4,000 lawyers. So the size of law firms have changed dramatically. And do you have a as to make changes that you made in legal education today? Yes. Uh, 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 when I was at law school, uh, aside from a small uh, moot court program that only a few people got involved in, uh, uh, the, the emergence of clinical legal education where law students, like, uh, like medical students, are actually handling matters uh, in housing court, uh, in, in, in state court, federal court, uh, for people that otherwise couldn't afford representation called clinical legal education. That's been dramatic and, and, uh, in the law schools. And I made that uh, a high priority of my uh, tenure as dean, along with uh, diversity and inclusion in the student body and also the faculty and in the administration of the school. Because uh, a school in New York City uh, should reflect uh, New York City and the, and the diversity of the city. And that became sort of a, a model in my mind for Fordham Law School. And, Thanks to the deans of the school, Dean Trainer, Dean Martin, Dean Diller, current dean, uh, the school is uh, is, a, is a, 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 a community of uh, of excellence as I see it. Well, there's a lot more questions I'd like to ask, but we have a number of interesting questions. Uh, uh, let me a number of the questions relate to uh, your background. So, uh, one person asked, "How did your immigrant family life?" impact your life philosophy? Well, my, uh, my, I guess you could say that uh, I was part of a family. My, as you pointed out earlier, uh, my, my parents uh, uh, gave us, uh, uh, we had two parents. Uh, uh, my father went away, of course, but uh, there was love in the home. And I saw uh, the model of uh, my parents with uh, uh, me and my four siblings. Uh, as a model to be replicated in my own life. And I got married to a wonderful woman. We've been married now for 58 years. We have six children, uh, 11 grandchildren. And, uh, and, uh, and, and what made, made uh, my family life uh, since law school work is uh, really my wife. Uh, she gave uh, a total dedication and devotion to our children and, uh, and was very supportive of me uh, uh, following uh, my interest and passion, as I've described it. Um, and a couple of questions ask a related question about, given your moral and cultural values, um, how much uh, influence did your faith, uh, your Catholic uh, background and faith have in your career? Uh, and thank, you, you thank you so much for asking me that question. It's been, a, it's been an integral part of my career. I, I discussed that in the book. I have a chapter in term, talking about the Catholic Church and, uh, and, and my own faith. And uh, of course, uh, my, my vision of, uh, of things changed uh, uh, from what I had as a, a kid, uh, thinking that uh, there was an exclusivity in terms of reaching heaven uh, uh, that it was associated with the Catholic Church. But I, I think salvation is there for everyone, and uh, and other faiths are uh, uh, obviously uh, have their uh, uh, program, their their doctrine, and uh, so my, my my views on uh, 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 a lot of subjects change, and and I I I, I saw the uh, I saw people of different uh, characteristics, uh, not when I was young, but uh, at the bar present as law school dean. 
and uh, and a lot of people have been discriminated against because of their personal characteristics and uh, and so many of those people that I knew are beautiful people and uh, that discrimination shouldn't have, shouldn't exist and uh, and just today I, I I was in a conference with a partner to Debbie Batts a former federal judge who lost her life and I said I want my I talk about my social justice center having an award in her name. And she, she was the first uh, 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 federal judge, I believe, in history to declare herself as being gay. Did that when she went on the federal bench and, and was a great judge, a jurist. And uh, so I, I, get, I, I began to see a larger vision of, uh, of the people. Uh, and I didn't see it uh, as it might have as a kid, as a uh, in a Catholic neighborhood, you might say we had some families of Jewish and Italian immigrant families, but there was a there was a heavy uh, uh, population of people like myself, an Irish Catholic. But uh, uh, I, I, I've grown in wisdom and understanding of the uh, of the larger world, and um, um, and I, I I think we're very lucky to have so many different wonderful people all over and. And we have a problem right now. We got to we got to bring people together more. Uh, apropos of that, someone asked if you were a long, young lawyer today offering your bono service, what area what area you pick to join and help? Uh, I, 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 in terms of pro bono. Uh, uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of areas that need help. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the housing area. You know, a lot of people have to deal with housing issues that uh, have no legal representation. Uh, there are programs that the government is trying to put into a, effect. Uh, 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 I would say there, there are so many poor people, low income people who can't afford uh, counsel and, uh, and, and they're, they're seeking help. And there are a lot of programs trying to reach those people, Legal Aid Society, all kinds of legal service offices. So I remember handling some Legal Aid Society cases when I was a young lawyer. And there were appeals, as I recall, and we were trying to vacate a, a judgment against a poor person. So uh, if you want to get involved in conflict resolution, uh, the courts have wonderful programs in conflict resolutions. Uh, so that this, uh, and, and there are a lot of people who can't really afford uh, counsel in court proceedings and there are mediation and arbitration programs uh, in, available to help people. So, uh, and if anybody uh, uh, hearing this message uh, wants to know more, I'm happy to sit down at, with anybody that wants to talk to me about this. Wow. I do that all the time with students at our law school. Yeah, what advice would you give young lawyers uh, and juniors today, given that the world has become so competitive and focused on money and polarized, what can we do, just asking a broader question, your view to make this world a better place? Well, I think uh, we who are uh, teachers and uh, employers and uh, having the opportunity to work with the younger people have to put an emphasis on the importance of your reputation, uh, the importance of, uh, of, um, of, of hard work, obviously, uh, respecting uh, uh, pe uh, people who might be your adversaries or uh, uh, you're annoyed about something. Uh, uh, those qualities help uh, shape uh, your reputation. And, uh, and a reputation provides a, a perception of quality uh, uh, to your representation uh, in the courts, uh, and uh, uh, and I, I I get very saddened when I see that uh, uh, a young lawyers might have slipped a little bit, and uh, and know that the consequence for losing your reputation is pretty severe. You don't want to you don't want to leave this world uh, uh, having a, a reputation that's soiled. Okay, on a, on a different point, someone asks. Back, is there anything significant in your career that you wish you could do differently? Something to, uh, I wish I'd do what, Michael? Is there anything significant in your career that you wish you could have done differently? Could have done differently. Uh, there's nothing really that uh, uh, I've had a lot of blessings, and uh, I, I would feel. Um, uh, 
uh, not not uh, accurate uh, to say that uh, um, that uh, I should have done this differently, that differently. Uh, certainly, draw, uh, striking the balance between work and family that's something I, I feel uh, I should have done a better job with. Uh, but my wife uh, was very supportive of everything I did. But on the other hand, it has its impact, uh, uh, it, uh, preventing you maybe to have time with your younger children, uh, particularly if you have a large family like I did. Uh, uh, I had more time with my older children than I did with my younger children. And uh, I, I miss that now. I miss that. Uh, I feel I, I missed those opportunities because I was so, uh, you might say, driven in my, uh, uh, what I was doing. And, uh, but I'm trying to make up uh, 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 at this point in my life and I just turned 84 so that uh, there's still some opportunity to um, uh, deal with some of those uh, uh, limitations in my life. And your grandchildren. Well, and your grandchildren particularly. How, how did you? balance all the extracurricular things that you were doing, being dean of Fordham and your family obligations? How do I balance it? Uh, I, I used uh, um, um, every day, seven days a week. I used uh, uh, getting up early in the morning and uh, working to uh, late at night uh, and, uh, and try to, uh, uh, you know, it's like now uh, you get a thousand emails a week. And uh, I, I, I stay up late at night, I get up early in the morning trying to respond to have, have all the communications I receive. So, and, and, but more than myself uh, and everything I've done, uh, I'm just a, a member of a group and people have always been around me to help me. And, uh, and, and without that, uh, I, I would have done so, uh, so little of what I've described. And, and I, I spent a lot of time in my book talking about uh, people who uh, surrounded me and guided me and, uh, and, and, mo and were models for me and helped me. Uh, just b before I forget, let me just know everyone, I, I want to recommend the book to everyone. Um, and if you uh, tell, if you go on the Fordham Law, uh, Fordham University Press website, write this, to get a 30% on the book. It, you just say in law 2020 and you will be able to uh, get a 30% discount on a book that I uh, hope this discussion we just had uh, highlights. Uh, uh, it's really remarkable. Um, John, before I make a couple of concluding remarks, you wanna give a little summation yourself? I just want to thank everyone who uh, uh, attended the program tonight and, uh, and, and hope there was uh, something that uh, I said that might have been uh, interesting or useful. And, and anybody that wants to follow up with a question, uh, uh, I'm happy to respond to it. And uh, I want to thank you, Mike, for uh, uh, the attention you gave to uh, all aspects of my book and my life. And I thank you very much. And I thank the City Bar. Uh, uh, I was the 56th president, and my favorite ball player growing up was Joe DiMaggio, and his number was 56. Uh, and so it was an honor for me to be the 56th president because that was the number of my favorite uh, uh, New York Yankee. Uh, and uh, someone asked me, for me to repeat how to uh, get the, uh, the book. I can't put it on chat, but it, it, just to repeat it again, from University Press website, and the promotion code is LAW, L-A-W 2020, and you can get a, uh, a discount if you, uh, if you do that. And uh, I, would, I would just add, Mike, that, that you pretty much can get it at any bookstore, and, and the discount differential is, is, is maybe $10. Um, and uh, let me just say, John, uh, I think on behalf of everyone listening, to thank you and, you know, John Farrick, as we've heard, has touched a lot of people's lives, both in the general uh, work he has done and also individually. And I just have to note at this point in time that 19, in 1994, I got a, 1996, I got a call 
from the then head of the nominating committee of the city <laughs> association. And that phone call changed my life. Uh, and uh, that's how I became the president of the city bar. So like so many others, John, thank you. Thank you for your time. Everyone else, thank you all for listening. And hopefully, uh, despite the uh, technical problems, we've all been able to hear this. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.